Oof. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I don't know if you can all hear me, if the mic's on, but I'll use my preaching voice. Happy Sabbath to you. Um, as uh, Tim shared, I, I grew up in this church, so it's good to be back. I preached my first sermon here as a Pathfinder, and Mrs. Rogers was the Pathfinder director. And so my wife and I have been wanting to come to Australia for the last three years, but something's happened, right, in the last three years. There was a little bit of COVID. You had COVID here as well? Yes. Yeah, it was everywhere. It was everywhere. And um, we were intending to come back, but uh, God uh, closed the doors earlier this year. I think God brought us back here at the right time, which was uh, here in December. And as a result of that, we've been uh, you know, on vacation here. I remember um, Pastor Jimmy giving me a call saying, would you be willing to preach at Hurstville? And you know when you're tired? <laughs> and uh, you just had, I don't know, if, is everyone still tired from COVID? <laughs> is everyone still tired? You just feel like it's, it's been a big year. It's been a big year for us. At Southern Adventist University, that's where I'm the VP for spiritual life. Uh, we've had, we have over 2,500 undergraduate students that we minister to and that I have the privilege of ministering as a chaplain. And at the end of the year, you just feel tired. And so the enemy came with a voice saying just, you know, when the enemy comes, just a small voice, not a big voice, just a small voice saying, just take it easy these next three weeks. You don't need to preach. But that only lasted a second because I know that Tim will be here opening the church in the morning. And he's been doing that since I was a kid. Isn't it good to have a church with doors open when people come? We can thank Tim for that. I knew that Anthony may be giving the Sabbath school, and he was giving the Sabbath school, still giving the Sabbath school uh, since I've been here. I knew Tether would be doing something in the morning here. She was leading out with the welcome. I knew that I'd see many familiar faces. In fact, my call to ministry... I made that decision in Fiji in 2004. And then our brother at the back here, I just saw him quickly. And we stayed at his house. He was taking care of the home there and showing us hospitality back in 2004. And that's where I made my decision to leave the world of business and accounting and go into full-time ministry. And as a result of that, it's just such a privilege. So I thought... I have to preach. I have to preach. Everyone is so dedicated here at Hurstville. Everyone is just still moving on with the mission. So I just gave that thought a little thought, and I just feel so privileged to be here and be here with my wife, Christina, as well. I started my ministry here at Hurstville. It was not an official ministry. I was doing what John Dave does, right? <laughs> doing the prayer here. Um, I think I was ordained as an elder here when I was 20, and I thought I was too young to be called elder. Can't be called elder at 20. But yeah, that's, that's what happened. And I just love Hurstville because it's always given young people an opportunity to be able to serve the Lord. And I just think this is such a special, special church. I left accounting to do ministry because I had a career, but I didn't have a calling. You see, there's a difference between a career and a calling. And you can have a calling to be an accountant, but that was not my calling. I remember having a really nice car when I was here. I had an Integra, Honda Integra Type R. It was a sports car. I don't know if you remember that. Actually, I bought that car from Tether's uh, family member back then, all right? And that's, that's where I bought it from. I had a sports car, but you can have a car, but you don't have a destination. Do you hear what I'm saying? You can have a, a house, but not a home. God is calling us to something bigger and something greater. I'm doing my doctorate right now, doctorate of ministry. In two years, hopefully I'll be wearing my doctoral robe. But the doctoral robe means nothing without the robe of Jesus Christ. We can have all this stuff, all these things, but unless we're in the mission and the will of God, all of these things are going to perish away. The only thing that will stand is God. You can have a bed, a really big bed, but not a good sleep if you don't have the peace of Jesus Christ with you. 
And so I'm just so grateful to see so many faithful here at Hurstville. This church is very, very special to me. So Pastor Jimmy, thank you for the invitation to be here. I am so blessed to be here. I can't wait to preach this message this morning. And so with that, I just invite you to bow your heads with me in prayer one more time. Lord, it is such a privilege to be here at Hurstville, to know that here in Australia, there are churches that are faithful to you. Lord, we're living in a dark hour of this earth's history. But Lord, that's when your people can shine the brightest through the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray right now that your spirit will be here with us. We are making room for you in our hearts. We are praying that your, your Holy Spirit will fill us and that, Lord, we will walk out of here different because we have been meeting with you. Lord, nothing to the cross I bring, only to the cross I cling. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to turn your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. But Luke enters the story with Caesar because of this. Luke wants you to know that even though Caesar has all the power on this earth, God is really in control. You see, it doesn't matter how much power a man has, God has ultimate power. He still sits on his throne. And that's why we as Christians don't need to be anxious who's in power politically. Amen? Some people get very anxious who's in power politically. Jesus was born, and there, when he was born, Caesar Augustus made a decree that everyone should be registered, and you would think, God, who is control, who's really in control here? And God wants you to know that even though Caesar had political power, it was really God in control, and God was using Caesar to fulfill a prophecy for Jesus. Did you know that? that the Messiah had to be born in Bethlehem. That's what the Old Testament prophecies say. And the way that Jesus was taken, by the way, Jesus grew up in Nazareth. He never grew up in Bethlehem. But the Messiah needed to be born in Bethlehem. How would God get Jesus from Galilee to Bethlehem? He would use Caesar, who thought he was in control. Have you ever thought that God can even use your enemies to get you to the place he wants you to be. Some of you resist those that might rub you the wrong way. Some of us resist difficult things, but God can use our difficulty to fulfill a destiny in our lives. And God used Caesar here to be able to get Jesus from Galilee to Bethlehem. God is really in control and Luke wants us to know God's really in control. Jesus is more powerful in a womb than Caesar is on a political platform. Don't we serve a mighty God? We serve a mighty God. So Caesar is there and the census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his city. If I was going to be registered, I'd be here at Hurstville. So hopefully uh, things, things, uh, God places you where he needs you to be. And, and I believe you're here this morning because God wanted you to be here. That God placed it within your heart to come here this morning. Joseph also.
those days, all right? In those days, people got married, then had children. But here, Mary is pregnant, but engaged. Not married yet. And yet, Joseph stood by her. Isn't that a good man? Young people, marry a good person. Marry someone that will stick by you. Here, Joseph, stuck by Mary, he believed what the angel said by faith, that she was pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And as a result of that, they were there, and she's with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. One, there was no room for them in the inn. I want to spend the next few moments talking about make room. Make room. Because as Seventh day Adventists, we believe in the Advent, the second return of Jesus. But do you know that God's people were not ready for his first return? When he, when he first came, rather? That there was no room for Jesus when he was born. Can you believe that? that God's people had no room for him when he first came. I pray that when Jesus comes again, that we will have room for Jesus in our hearts, that he will find room within our lives and within our hearts because he is coming again soon. How many of you believe that? That when he comes again, may he find room in our hearts for him. There was no room for Jesus in the end, I just want to start with an illustration here. In the US, people can have a lot of stuff. Do you have a lot of stuff in your house? In fact, in the United States, we have a show called Hoarders. Have you heard of this show? Have you watched this show, Hoarders? These are, if you don't know what a hoarder is, these are people that have so much stuff in the house and they're afraid of throwing anything away. Don't look at your husband or your wife when, you, when I say that, okay? They're, they're afraid of throwing things away. They can have things in their house where it can become dangerous, okay? If you have children, it could become dangerous. A whole pile of newspapers from 1784 could land on, the, on your child and keep them trapped. They have so much stuff. And there was a show and an episode that I saw and watched. And this episode was called Every Day is Christmas. Now, why was it called Every Day is Christmas? Well, there was a, a lady there by the name of Anne, and she shared how much she loved Christmas. She said she loved Christmas so much because when she would decorate her house, everyone would come to her home and compliment her. They'd say, wow, you just decorate your house so beautifully. But year after year, she'd keep adding and adding and adding to the Christmas decorations to a point where the house was so full that none of her friends could visit her anymore. Why? Because there was no room. There was no room in the house. In fact, the camera you'll see moved from Sharon to her husband. And she was so excited about her Christmas decorations but when they moved the camera to the husband, he didn't have the same expression. He was like, what is this? Have you ever been in a situation where your husband's excited or your wife's excited about something, but you're not as excited as them? And he said, this has gotten to a point where he can no longer take the Christmas decorations down. The house is so full. In fact, it looked something like this. This isn't the down. Is it possible that we can have so much stuff in our houses, maybe in our hearts, that there is no room for what is truly important in life? 
that there is no room for what God wants to do in our lives. And they have so much stuff that there is no room for family and friends during Christmas. Is it possible that this season we can have our hearts filled with so much stuff that we have no room for Jesus? That we have no room for what is truly important in life? And so that's what we're going to spend the next few few moments looking at. The reality is, and the question we have today is that, is Jesus knocking on your heart today? And if he is, is there room for him? Is there room for him? Or is there so much stuff that we can have no longer any room for what is truly important? Today, I want to reveal to you three transformative truths about how to make room for Jesus. Three transformative truths of how to make room for Jesus. And the first truth is this. We've got to recognize that making room for Jesus is the opportunity to say, Jesus, there are times in my life, there are opportunities in my life you give me that when I make room for you, Jesus will come in. Some of us think, God, I've got too much mess in my life. There's no way you'll come into my place. Your job is not to clean your mess. And some of us think that's our job, to clean the mess. Jesus says, you just invite me in and I will clean the mess. When Jesus said, I want you to be fishers of men, he didn't say clean the fish. He just said, catch the fish. And some of us think it's our job to clean the fish. Jesus didn't say, how many of you have been fishing? How many of my Fijian brothers and sisters have been fishing? Your job is just to catch the fish. But Jesus will clean the fish. Amen? Through His Spirit, that's what He does. And so, Luke chapter 2, verse 7. not their first option they did not want to that was not their they never thought that they would lay Jesus in a manger but they had to because there was no room for Jesus in the inn I wonder and I know that there are times where we end up in a situation because of something have you ever been in a situation because of something because something went wrong I know that for many of us, we can, we can see a wonderful Christmas decorations all around the malls and all around all the shopping centers here. We can see a lot of beauty during Christmas time. But the reality is this, the Christmas story is not a story that is too beautiful. It's actually, there's a, there's a lot of inconvenience. There's a lot of challenges. It's not an easy situation. Jesus was laid in a manger because he was rejected by the innkeeper. Jesus was laid in a manger that looked like something like pet and you love your pet in fact 40 percent of australians say that they spend more money on their pets than themselves that's how much people love animals and love pets recently and i did some research there was a dog that inherited from an estate this is the richest dog in the world 400 million dollars in the estate 
I know, that, that's more than probably this whole room combined, right? This church combined. That's how much people love their pets. But I guarantee that no matter how much you love animals and you love your pets, you would never lay your baby in a place where animals eat. No matter how much you love your dog, you would never lay your newborn baby in the bowl that your dog eats from. You wouldn't do it. You, but that's where Jesus was laid. He was laid in a manger because there was no room in the inn. The reality is, Jesus did not try to escape difficult circumstances. In fact, Jesus could have been born in a palace, right? If he wanted to be. He could have been born in a five-star hotel if he wanted to be. But yet, Jesus chose to be born in a manger. And yet, some of us may say, God, that's, that's something I'm repulsed by. That's something I would never want to experience. Here's the thing. Jesus was there because. How many of you have been in a situation because of something? How many of you, maybe not in a literal manger, but you're in... Because someone rejected you. Maybe you're in a situation because you've been hurt. Some people are not in church today because of something. Because they've been hurt, they've been rejected, they feel like there's no room for them in the church. Many of us are in a situation because. Maybe you're in a situation because you've gone through a divorce. Maybe you're in a situation because your father left home. Maybe you're in a situation because of a doctor's report you received. Maybe you're in a situation because no one taught you any better. Have you ever, church, let's get, have you ever been in a situation because of something? Because. I'm here because there was no room for me. I'm here because I'm facing a challenge. I'm here because things did not go the way I expected. That is the story of the birth of Jesus Christ. He is in a situation because there was no room for him. And yet, his because did not stop him from becoming the Savior of the world. I just want you to know this morning, your because cannot stop what you'll become. And some of us give up too easily because of something. And we look back because they did this and because they did that and because of him and because of her. Don't let your because stop you from what you can become. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't let your because stop you from what you can become. And that's the Jesus that we serve. His because could not stop him from becoming the savior of the world. Even though he was wrapped in swaddling cloths, even though he was born in a manger, his glory was too great for a manger to stop him from being what God called him to be. He was defined by the Spirit. He was not defined by... ...stopped. The manger never stopped him from becoming our Savior. And as a result of his... What do I mean by that? Not only did the manger not stop him from becoming our Savior, but he only went to places that God had provided for him. Let's go.
imagine Joseph knocking on every door saying, is there room? Is there room? And if it was me, if it was me, if I'm by myself, I can be a certain way. But if you harm my family, if you harm, you know, I can, I can turn into a little different kind of person. I'll, I'll just be on. How many of you are protective of your families? If, some, if someone hurt your child, you'd be protective, right? You'd be protective. In fact, don't marry someone that's not protective of you. Because you, you protect what you value, right? You protect what you value. So Joseph is there and he's got a pregnant wife, okay? He's got a pregnant wife. She's about to deliver. For the nursing students, the water has broken, okay? All right, she's about to deliver. And then the innkeeper has the nerve to say, there's no room for you. What would you do as a husband? You'd be like, you better make some room, right? That's what we'd say. You better, you better find somewhere that I can have my baby delivered. But Joseph didn't do that. Joseph didn't try to manipulate the situation. And it's a fine line, right, in Christianity between taking initiative and following God's plan. How do you know the difference sometimes, right? Like, God, do you want me to take initiative here? Or do you want me to follow your plan? And yet Joseph said, okay, if there's no room for me here, I'm not going to force a situation. I'm not going to make this happen. I'm not going to try to fit into places I'm not welcome. I'm not going to try to fit into places that weren't made for me. I'm going to go a little deeper here. Young people, don't try to fit into someone's heart that has no room for you. Don't try to make someone like you. Don't try to force something to happen that is not part of God's will. Sometimes if someone doesn't have room for you, if someone doesn't have room for you, then they're not made for you. Amen? Let's look at the church. Let's not try to make Scripture fit my preference. Some of us try to make the Bible fit my preference, in my opinion. And the reality is, even though we don't create idols out of wood and stone, do you know you can create an idol out of God based on your preference? Oh, my God doesn't believe in that. My God wouldn't do that. Hey, hey, hey. We cannot create a false image. We have to take God at face value of what Scripture says. Don't make the Word of God fit your preference. We need to fit into the Word of God. And, that, you know, we could go into Revelation 13 and all of that, of Babylon trying to change the Word of God to fit man's preference. And that's not what God is intending here. In fact, we are not meant to fit what we're not made for. And I have this on the screen here. to want to fit in with people I just wanted to belong sometimes and you know people will tell I'm you know I'm I wasn't the coolest cat on the block okay but I would try to do things to be cool and it didn't fit me because I was not made for that and I just want to use an example here just want to use an example I'm going to ask you my brother here to stand up can can we just do an illustration here all right I'm going to Got my jacket here. Got my jacket here. Can we just swap jackets for for a second? Just for a second. I'll give it back. What's your name again? Remind me. I know your son did the prayer. Chris. Your name is Chris. Chris, thank you for letting me use your jacket here. Chris, you make this jacket look good. I'm not going to make it look as good as you. Okay? I'm going to... But, Chris, I'm going to... I'm, I'm, I don't want to rip your jacket, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to leave it here. Uh, close, close. It's not going to make it. How do Chris and I look? We look okay? Look at this. You make that jacket look better than me, but how do Chris and I look? Why are you laughing? Why? The reality is we don't fit in each other's jackets and we look silly right 
And the reality is, I'm going to keep preaching for a little bit with this. The reality is that, Chris, some people look silly trying to fit into the world where they made to be the children of God. Do you hear what I'm saying? And some of us think, oh, I look cool. No, you don't look cool. You look silly. Because you were made to be a child of God. The Bible says you are a holy nation, a royal priesthood brought out of darkness to God's marvelous light. We are not children of darkness. We are children of light. But when the light try to fit into the darkness, this is how you look. You look silly. Because we were not made to fit into something that wasn't made for us. Chris, thank you so much. Man, I'm going to return this for you. Thank you for being a great sport. Give Chris a round of applause here. Thank you. Thank you. God has made us to fit into his purpose and his calling. And don't try to fit into places that weren't made for you. The reality is God has a calling for your life. God has a mission for your life. And when you fit into God's calling, it's going to fit just right. You're not going to look silly because it's made by God, tailor-made by God. You don't need tailor-made by Calvin Klein. You don't need tailor-made by Tommy Hilfiger. So many people want to put other people's names on their bodies. Tommy Hilfiger did not die for you. Calvin Klein did not die for you. Amen. Jesus Christ died for us. Let's be willing to put his robe of righteousness on us. When we fit into what we're made for, we will feel God's calling in our lives. And so here, Jesus did not fit, seek to fit into what he wasn't made for. Psalms chapter 119 verse 45 says, I will walk about in freedom for I have sought out your precepts. So many people don't walk in freedom because they're trying to fit into something that wasn't made for them. God's law tells us what we're made for, what we're meant to fit into. And so here Jesus, because he was willing to fit and reside in a manger, as a result of him saying, I'm going to humble myself, it didn't stop the glory of God working through his life. Is there anyone here this morning that has ever tried to fit into something that didn't fit them? Have you ever been in that situation? Maybe it's a job, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's a ministry. The reality is we need to stop trying to fit into rooms that have no space for us. Fitting into people's hearts, fitting into groups of friends. I'm so glad that when I was at Hurstville Church, there was places for me to fit into. And if I didn't know how to do it, someone would teach me. Mrs. Rogers at Pathfinders, I did not know how to cook when I went camping. I just didn't know how to do it. She taught me how to make a, 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 like a potato thing, right? Where you put it in the uh, fire and you cover it with aluminum or aluminum here. And then, uh, and then just create, I just had noodles. That's all I used to have. But she taught me how to do something because she was trying to teach me how to fit into things that were made for me. Is there anyone here this morning that may be, in, may be in a room that doesn't fit them right now? Maybe you're doing something that doesn't fit you right now. You're in the wrong room. And the Bible says there's no room for you in the inn for a reason. There's no room for you in the inn because I didn't make you to be in the sin. I made you for something greater, and we're going to go into that. Here, Joseph didn't prepare very well, did he? How would you rate Joseph for, as a husband from 1 to 10 when it came to organizing accommodations? You know, he could have at least checked Airbnb, right? To make sure that there was room. He didn't, he didn't organize very well, but even his mistakes turned into a miracle. God can even make your mistakes turn into a miracle. And we're going to look at that a little more as well. There was no room in the inn because that room was not made for him. And the reason why the room was not made for him was because God had a greater purpose. And the second, the third thing we're going to look at is this. There was no space for Jesus so that he could provide a place for you. 
there was no space for Jesus so that he could provide a place for you. Luke chapter, eight verses, Luke chapter 2 verses 8 to 12. Your darkest moments, God has a message for you. Do you know that's what angel means? Angel means messenger. At the darkest moments in life, God has a message for you. And they stood before them and the glory. He's going to be wrapped in swaddling cloths and placed in a food trough where animals eat. What a sign. That's going to be the sign of the Savior of the world. I just want you to know that there are some, some signs that God gives us that don't make sense that we need to accept by faith. There are some prophecies we go, God, how will this ever happen? But we need to accept by faith. That was the sign. If someone told you the savior of the world was born in a place where animals eat, how, how convinced would you be? He said, that will be the sign to the shepherds. The manger would be the sign pointing to the Messiah. His rejection at birth will actually be a foreshadowing of his rejection during life. Some of you have been rejected and you think, God, why am I? Do you know Jesus was rejected? There was no room for him at birth. And that would be a foreshadowing for the rest of his life. If Jesus was rejected, what makes you think you won't be rejected? If Jesus was rejected, what makes you think everyone's going to like you and everyone's going to accept you? And when, when you share the message of Jesus, everyone's going to accept it. The reality is it's the humble of the humble that were there at his birth. Here, the shepherds were there. And some people think the wise men were there during that time. No, that came a few days later. It was, it was the shepherds in this moment. They later came to another location. But here, the shepherds were in and came to the manger. That was the sign. What is the reality here? The shepherds were the outcasts of society. Jesus wants you to know that the outcasts of society are welcome to his presence. Did you know that? That you don't have to have your life all cleaned up to be present where Jesus is. The shepherds were those that were outcasts, but they were there where Jesus was because they had faith. The religious leaders weren't there. The rabbis weren't there. The reality is the shepherds were there. And this is what I believe that Jesus chose, and some people believe that he was born in a cave where animals were. We don't have conclusive evidence as scholars, but some people believe it was a cave where people kept their animals a little further away from maybe where they lived. And so he may have been born in a cave. And I thought about this, don't, don't quote me on this, but is it possible, is it possible that Jesus, had he been born in the inn, 
would not have had room for the shepherds at his birth. That he wanted to be born in a place because the shepherds were guarding their sheep. Not only did the shepherds came, they would have come with their sheep, right? They're not going to just leave their sheep out in the, out in the pastures. They may get stolen or killed by, by wolves. They brought their sheep, but is it possible that he wanted to have room for the outcasts at his birth? that he needed more room for those that needed to hear about him. I just want you to know this morning this, that God was willing to not have room in the inn so that he can have room for you as an outcast by sin. That God was thinking of you, thinking of those that maybe felt like they were rejected, maybe felt like there was no room for them. And if you've ever felt that way, have any of you ever experienced rejection? Have any of you ever experienced the time where you felt unwelcome and maybe you felt like God? This following you is hard. Any of you that think being a Christian is easy? I know there's a lot of prosperity gospel out there. God will give you a million dollars if you, <laughs> if you get baptized. The reality is being a Christian is difficult. Doing the right thing is hard. But even though you're rejected by others, you'll be accepted by God. And that's the main thing, right? Who cares? We don't need to please man. We need to please God in life. And as a result of that, he made, a, he made room for the shepherds at his birth. And so I want to finish with this as we draw to a close here. going to make room for him are you going to have room for him when you hear him knock are you going to have room for him or are you going to say sorry there's no room i've got too much stuff in my life and some of us may think those hoarders that i talked about you go that's not me i'm not a hoarder well here's the thing are you hoarding unforgiveness in your heart are you hoarding anger in your heart are you hoarding things within your heart that will keep Jesus out? Are you hoarding pride in your heart? Are you hoarding things that will keep Jesus out from transforming your life for him? What things do you have in your heart that may keep Jesus out? He's saying this morning, I'm knocking. Are you willing to have me come into your heart? So I have these three questions. Have you ever felt like there was no room I to say, God, this season, I've got so much going on in my life. But the reality is, if I don't have room for you, things will never change. If I don't have room for you, maybe I won't be ready when you come. If I don't have room for you, Lord, I might end up in a situation that gets man's glory, but it will never receive your glory or your acceptance. God is saying, are you willing to make room for me? I pray and I wonder what would happen in your life if you made room for Jesus today? Maybe it's in a certain area. What would change? What would be different? How would the community recognize Hurstville Church even more as a place that has room for them and room for Jesus? My prayer is that when you hear Jesus knocking, you will make room for him. Amen. And if that's your desire, I'm going to just have a word of prayer. And during my prayer, I just invite you to raise your hand wherever you are. And if you say, Lord, I want to make room for you. Eyes are shut, heads are bowed. God sees you. And we want to invite him to make room in our hearts for him. Lord, we thank you that over 2,000 years ago, you came 
We know it's not exactly December 25, but we recognize that this is a moment where we can turn our hearts to you. And Lord, we pray that as you came in a manger, it didn't stop you from being the Messiah. We recognize right now, dear Lord, that there are some experiencing difficulty because something happened to them, because they went through something painful, something difficult. But their because cannot stop you from them achieving what you want them to become. Lord, we also recognize that some of us are trying to fit into the world, fit into uh, the corporate ladder, fit into trying to impress people with our stuff. But the reality is it can in create a situation within our hearts where there is no room for you. Lord, right now, we pray that you will clear the clutter in our hearts, that you, we, you will remove anything that is not of you. And we invite you, we hear you knocking. And if that's anyone here this morning, I just pray that you lift your hand up to Jesus and he sees you, he knows, he reads your heart, he knows where you're at. And Lord, you promise that if, you, if we open the door, you will come in. Lord, we claim that promise right now. We know that we're sinners, but you're a great Savior. And we pray that as we open our hearts to you, that you will come in and clear the clutter within us so that we will be furnished for your soon return. Lord, we thank you for this prayer. We thank you for answering this prayer because we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for that wonderful sermon. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for one of Hurstville's greatest sons to be here with his family and to come out and to reach out to everyone that I hear this morning. And I hope that you do enjoy that sermon. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor. And on behalf of Hurstville Church, I'd like to say a vote of thanks by thanking you for spending time with your family here at Hurstville Church. Thank you so much. I shall call upon our song leaders to come forward and to sing our last songs and don't forget there's luncheon at the back you can spend time with him so as his wife too you can talk to both both of them thank you so much please stand <laughs>
Praise the Lord. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we thank you and we give you glory for what you have done. By sending your son, Jesus Christ, you have given us all the opportunity to be saved by you and through your grace. And we're so grateful that you promised to come in, to come into our lives that may be crammed by the clutter of this world, to come into our lives when we have made mistakes in our past and you promise to make us new again. So Lord, once again, we invite you into our hearts. May we make room for you. 